this morning I have the absolute honor and privilege to share that you are invited from January the 16th to the 22nd for a week of prayer and fasting. We are calling as a leadership team the whole church to join us in a week of seeking God and believing for what he has planned in 2023, we will align with, we will submit to, and we will be his vessels for all that he has in store. So this title is sermon is messaged, an invitation to pray and fast with us. You are invited to pray and fast with us. Maybe you have grown up in church and you have experienced a lot about prayer and you understand what it is. Maybe you haven't. Prayer is a conversation with God. It goes two ways. We talk to him, he talks to us. It's a conversation that is so beautiful and so intimate. And like any relationship, sometimes it takes time to cultivate, to get comfortable with the new person that you're talking to. But that is, in essence, what prayer is. It's communicating with God. And fasting, again, maybe you're aware of what fasting is, and maybe you're not. Well, I'd love to unpack quite in a more of a deep and practical level of what fasting is to prepare us as a church that when we start the week of prayer and fasting, we start strong, we start well, as well as finishing well and finishing strong. So what is fasting? In essence, fasting is refraining from food for a specific time and for a spiritual purpose. Fasting is hungering after God. As my question, are you hungry this morning for God? Well, if your honest answer is, not really, join us with a prayer and fasting. It brings you into that place of hungering after God. Now, note here, I've made it clear to say it's refraining from food. Biblical fasting isn't fasting, social media, technology, pleasures of life and enjoyment. They are things that are good to abstain from and sometimes we need to reprioritize our time and energy in life. But biblical fasting is actually either removing some aspect of food or all food for a period of time. It is that physical element that we have to say, I am going without something that actually biologically I need food as is medicine, as fuel for my body to replenish itself. I'm going without that to show you, God, how serious I am about doing business with you. I'm, I'm, I'm removing that aspect in my life. And every time I get those hunger pains and, and I'm ready to kind of in, have a nice meal. Do you know what? I'm going to go to you in your presence, God, and go, but I hunger after you more, and I thirst after you more. So it's just to note that the fasting is refraining from food for a specific time and a spiritual purpose, and fasting is hungering after God. Hopefully, you're able to keep up with me. There's plenty to go through this morning, and hopefully the handouts help you to follow along. But there is plenty of myths and misunderstandings about what fasting is. And so I thought we could do a little quick myth busting about what fasting is not. Is that okay? So I've got four often common myths that people can think or believe about what fasting is that we'd like to just correct this morning. And the first one is fasting is not for super Christians. It is not for that person that you think, ah, well, they're the A-star style of, of Christianity. Oh, well, they really love God. No, actually, fasting is for every follower of Jesus. You'll see in Matthew 6 on your notes, 16 to 18, Jesus is doing his Sermon on the Mount. It's one of the most famous sermons um, that's ever been told. It's because it's by Jesus Christ. And he's doing this long discussion, going through lots of different topics. And within this, he talks about fasting. And he says this, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We don't want a motivation of the reason we're going into fast is so that people admire us and go, oh, aren't you hardcore? Oh, you're brilliant. We see a practical example of this in Luke 18, 12. Jesus calls out a Pharisee. One of the Pharisees is boasting that he fasts twice a week. Oh yes, do quick maths, that's over 100 times a year. He has decided to abstain from food and to fast for God. Sounds admirable, sounds really holy and really good, but God knows the motive of the heart. And what's interesting is he boasts that he fasts on the second and the fifth day of the week. 
Well, scholars say that they're the days of the week when it was the market days. That is the day of the week where everyone would see and know what you're up to and what you're doing. Do you think it's by chance that this particular Pharisee, who maybe his motive was to have admiration from others, chose the days that he would fast when most people would see him? So that he can boast and go, look at how good I am. That is not what fasting is meant for. That's why Jesus is going, when you do fast, don't let people know. And sometimes God calls you as an, in, as an individual to fast for him. On this occasion, we are fasting as a church, so naturally we're going to be in the know. But we don't need to boast. There is not need to be an arrogance of, well, look at me. Or, and we'll talk later about different types of fast. You know, it's not like one fast is going to trump another fast in by any means. It's the sacrifice of your heart. And God sees the motive and the hunger that you want to thirst after him for. But also at the beginning, those first three words, when you fast... There is an assumption that you're going to fast. That actually, as believers and followers of Jesus, that this is a practice, a spiritual discipline that we partake in on a regular basis. And so there is an expectancy that it's not just for the set-aside few, but it is for all believers to take part in in fasting. Second myth I want to bust is that fasting isn't just about food. If you just abstain from food and you don't pray, you don't seek God, you don't spend time in his presence, that isn't fasting. That's a bit of like an intermittent fasting maybe. If you're doing a partial fast, it's probably just a really bad diet because the minute you start eating again, your metabolism kind of kicks in again. It's a, it's a, it might have some health benefits. Maybe sometimes you've got to fast before you go for a surgery and they say, can you not eat for 24 hours? But that's not a biblical fast unless you have set aside, you've consecrated time, you said this time is holy, and to prove that I am fasting, I am abstaining from food, and I am going to seek your presence, God, and I am going to hunger after you. In essence, fasting is feasting on God. It's feasting on God's guidance. It's feasting on his hope, on his power. It's feasting on his forgiveness. It's feasting on his presence. It's feasting with him. So in essence, fasting is a sacrifice of the physical, but it's an abundance of the spiritual. That's what fasting is. The third myth to bust is that fasting is not earning an answer to prayer. It's not like a slot machine, you put it in and something comes out. Fasting is a means of seeking God's bless, uh, not seeking God's blessing as much as seeking God. The challenge is sometimes we can turn to a practice as the end of itself rather than realizing that's a means to an end. We can do that with any spiritual discipline. We can do it with prayer. We can do it with coming to church. We can do it with any giving. You could use that as a means to itself when actually really that's just, um, yeah, an external practice of something that's going on internally. And if we're not ready to prepare our hearts for this time of prayer and fasting, it will become just something of routine, of a ritual, and not something that is actually a devotion that we are committing to God. We see this in the Old Testament in Zechariah. Um, God prompts the prophet Zechariah to actually ask a really difficult question to the people of God. And he says, will you say this to the priests as well as the people of God? He says, was it really for me that you were fasting? Ouch. Could you imagine if like, that was the word for God this morning? It would be like, yeah, so is it really for me that you're fasting? I don't know about you. I don't want to get to the 22nd, the last day of our fasting, and for that to be what God is saying to us. But was it really for me or was it for you? Did you have other intentions and motives rather than seeking me? It's a bit of a sobering thought, isn't it? Okay, and the last myth to bust this morning is fasting is not manipulation. We are not twisting God's arm into doing something. God is not obligated to respond to your expectation of him, right? Really, what fasting does is it aligns ourselves with God. Our steps, what our direction, our focus actually gets corrected into what God's alignment is and the timing that he has purposed and the answer he has purposed, which we'll look to in a moment when we hear about how Dan, uh, David fasted and what answer he got when that happened. We can't manipulate God when we fast. We just come to him with adoration and with a listening ear for what he's wanting to do in us and through us. 
Okay, so we've busted some myths. Let's look at why we should fast then this morning. So number one, it shows your hunger for God. The depth of your desire to see God move in your family, in your workplace, in this church, your depth of your desire to see him expand, to continue to transform lives through faith, hope, and love, that depth of desire is shown through fasting. It shows you're really ready to do business with God. Maybe you're in the need of a fresh encounter, a deeper, more intimate relationship with God. Fasting is an incredible way to do that. You are serious about it, and you're ready to pay a personal price for it as well. In Joel uh, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God will cry out to the Lord. Here, and there's a, a long um, phrase, but basically Joel is calling the people as a collective, corporate people to pray and fast. And then in Joel 2, 12, it says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. There is something that shifts within us when we bring ourselves and together, there'll be something that'll shift as, for us as a church when we consecrate a week, when we set apart a week and say, we are seeking after you, God, and you first. So why we fast is it shows to God, and God loves to see it. That's why he asks his people to fast and pray. He loves to see that you are demonstrating that hunger for him. It's a beautiful thing in his eyes. And the second reason why we fast is it gives more time to pray. Read your Bible. It gives you more time. The time that you practically would have spent cooking and eating and then washing up, going to the shops and buying food. That time, maybe you've said to God, oh, I'd love to, but I just don't have the time. There you go. You have the time set apart where you would normally be doing other activities that you can spend with God. Maybe this morning there is a friend that you are seeking God just to reveal themselves to him, to say, oh, they need salvation. They, they, they need the hope that I found. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a child, a parent, an auntie, a grandparent. You're seeking God after. Imagine all those hours that you can spend seeking God. Prodigal son who, well, there's two prodigal sons. The one that stayed at home, if you read Luke 15, he um, is as much of a prodigal son as the one who left and squandered his father's wealth because he was in the father's house, yet he misunderstood what it is to be a son of the house. And so if you read um, Luke 15, really that's the prodigal son the, the writing about. But the prodigal son that we often know it in, in literature and in um, sermons, the one that went away and squandered his fam father's inheritance, and he's left in this pit with pigs and he's eating the muck and he's going, do you know what, I'm so hungry, this looks delicious. And he goes, even my father's servants are trapped better than this. That hunger stirred him to move. Do you know what, if we prayed and we were hungry for souls to be saved, God can create that hunger and that stir in our community. Do you believe that? That actually we can see not just ones and twos and dozens of people being saved, but hundreds and thousands. Why? Because there's hundreds and thousands of people that live in our area. And we want to see every single one of them know the love and forgiveness that God has for them, the value that's put on their life. Maybe there's a big decision that you've got to make. Will you seek God in prayer? Do you desire to know God's will for your life? Seek God in prayer. Perhaps God has revealed promises and dreams to you and you go, but this is only possible with your power. Well, seek God's presence and power through prayer. It gives us more time practically to seek God. Number three, the reason why we pray and fast is it releases God's supernatural power. Are you this morning in need of a breakthrough? A breakthrough in your marriage, a breakthrough in your mental health, a breakthrough in your career, a breakthrough in your relationship with your children, a breakthrough with your healing, maybe you're struggling and battling with some illness this morning, breakthrough maybe with deliverance and some of the demonic side of things. Whatever you are needing breakthrough for, you can come to God and he releases a supernatural power. Prayer and fasting is often used as a tool against the enemy. We see it throughout the Bible. And one of them, an um, example, is Jesus saying this in Mark 9. The disciples have just witnessed um, Jesus deliver a, a man from um, demonic and um, 
just evil spirits within him, and the, the disciples are going, how could we like, not get this you know, boy free? How come it was only you? And Jesus says, some things can only happen through prayer in Mark 9, 29, and some manuscripts even say prayer and fasting. Well, whichever manuscript you go in, the prayer is the essence. It's God is the essence. It's not through our power. And there's other examples that we'll go through shortly as well, where it releases God's supernatural power as we seek him and pray and fast. And as a church, I believe that we can use this week of prayer and fasting as a decisive blow against the enemy. You know, whatever tactics he thought he could ploy towards us in 2023, there's like a big detonator bomb goes off and goes, not today, Satan, not today, not for my family, not for my church, not for Teesside, not for even the UK. Whatever you thought you were able to plan for 2023, we've got a bigger thing coming. And so we're able to partner with God and defeat and triumph over whatever the enemy tries to plan because light always overcomes darkness. It's never a battle. Okay, so here's some examples then of how we get to see um, God using um, prayer and fasting as a way to defeat the enemy, as it were. And in some senses as well, it's how it prepares us as believers for the answer God has got in store. When we're seeking and, and praying for different things, we often have a bit of an answer of how we expect God to reply. And sometimes we have to come purely into his presence and wait on him for a while before he works in us so we can be ready for the reply. So the first one, maybe you can try and guess it. It says blank, fasted for receiving the Ten Commandments. Who received the Ten Commandments? Moses, there we go. So Moses fasted. Now uniquely, Moses did a very unique fast that I am actually saying don't do, okay? And this is why. He fasted food and water for 40 days and 40 nights while he was with God. Now, the reason why I say when you read that, don't say that as a model for your life, is because we can only survive three days without water, okay? So please do not abstain from water for 40 days. But when Moses was doing this unusual fast, he was in the presence, the physical presence, of God, who is the sustainer of life, okay? So he was in a very unique situation where God had called him for that. Please do not be doing that over this week of, you know, not drinking fluids, thank you. <laughs> I do not need any emails about that one. And then the next one is a blank fasted before a miraculous victory in Second Chronicles. This is a people, this is a group in Second Chronicles. Does anyone have an idea? It's the Israelites, the whole people of God, were called to fast before they saw their miracle and their breakthrough. It's that dependency that we have on God. Okay, the, the reference might give this one away. Blank fasted in order to receive guidance from God. Daniel, there you go. Daniel fasted, um, and he, we see, has, has a real routine and rhythm of prayer and fasting throughout, so you've got a few scriptures there. Okay, the next one, blank fasted before the beginning of a major building project. Who was that? Nehemiah, that's right. Nehemiah sought after God's will before he started a project. Maybe there are some projects that is from God that he's asking you to do, but you need to seek him first. And that's what we're saying as a church. We're saying there are things that God has given us to do this year, but before we crack on, we're going to seek after him. We're going to pray and fast, because like we've heard before, without his power, it's absolutely pointless. Okay, the next one. This person fasted before seeing the king and saving her people from a genocide. Esther, well done. Esther was actually married to the king, if you didn't know that. And it sounds really strange in our culture to think, well, why does she have to pray and fast before she goes to see the king? In that situation, if she went to the king without an invitation, she would have been killed. I know some of you husbands in the room are going, oh, I wonder if I could instill that. No, you cannot, okay? <laughs> there is no invitation policy now. But yeah, it's amazing that how she actually not only fasted herself, but she called her uncle Mordecai and said, will you get all the Jews to fast and pray with me? She understood there's an importance of a collective fast together. There's strength when we fast in unity together. Okay, here's the next one. See if you can fill this blank. So this, it's a group of people, again, fasted when they heard Jonah's message from God. They repented and God showed mercy and compassion. Who did Jonah go to see? 
Nineveh. So the people of Nineveh, when they heard the message basically of doom and gloom, and it was, you're all doing really bad stuff and bad things are going to happen therefore, they heard Jonah's message, who remember was reluctant to even give it in the first place. Why? Because he knew that if he shared it, that actually, and people repented, that God would show mercy. And for whatever in his humanity thought, they didn't deserve mercy. It's a, it's a message for us to realize, actually, everyone deserves the message of grace. Everyone deserves the message of mercy. And because they sincerely, the king and all the people, repented and fasted of their ways, God looked after them and helped them. Okay, here's the next one. So this person prayed and fasted for his son to be healed. In 2 Samuel 12, anyone got any ideas of who that could have been, who was praying and fasting for his son to be healed? He was a king, David. David prayed and fasted, and here I want you to notice that actually his son wasn't healed, and his son died. And when his son died, David got up, washed himself, went and ate, and moved on. When we pray and fast, remember, we're not manipulating God. We can't come and earn the right to the answers to the prayer that we're coming for. And for whatever unknown reason that we might have for why God did not heal that young boy, David trusted God. And David got up and moved on. Maybe you're thinking, oh, Faith, I've tried prayer and fasting before, and it didn't work. Maybe it did, maybe it's forming things within you that is a deeper, more mysterious understanding that we can understand and prepares you for an answer that maybe is always gonna happen, but in a better way for you to receive it. Maybe you're feeling disappointed with God because of the ways that you have tried to do things for him, but life hasn't worked out the way. It's not a, some sort of magical formula. It's a way of us seeking after God and trusting him with the answer and the result. That takes a grit in our faith to trust him with the answer and the result, especially when it doesn't go our way, especially when it's not what we expect. But deciding to do what David did, to get up and to go again, that is amazing. And notice David um, prayed and fast later on in his life as well. Okay, the next one. Who devoted her life to serving God in the temple? Anna, the prophetess, yes. So in Luke, you will notice just after the whole birth narrative that we just had after Christmas, then um, the Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple, and Anna is a prophet there, and she ends up speaking words over Jesus. And she has, and it just says it's part of her routine. It, they, it's just like a little side comment. I wonder if we had one sentence about us, what would, how would that one sentence be described? For Anna, it was someone who devoted and served herself in the temples all the days of her life, and she prayed and fasted. Like, that is some sentence about your life. I wonder what our sentence would be as a church, as individuals, as a family. Okay, number nine. I hope you all get this one. Blank fasted during the victory over temptation. Jesus, come on. That's the answer you're always given, like, um... Sunday school, isn't it? Whatever the answer is, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. So Jesus did, when he was uh, baptized by John the Baptist, he comes up, the dove ascends at God's voice of this is the son who I'm well pleased. Note that happens even before Jesus starts his ministry. God is saying, I am well pleased with you. God loves you and he's pleased with you before you start serving him and working for him. You know, he loves you so, so dearly and he makes that clear, that identity with Jesus straight at the beginning. He lets it known to every person that this is my son. And then what happens? It's like some sort of kind of like crazy movie. He gets taken straight away from, uh, from that place to the desert by the Holy Spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit has led him to a place of temptation. The Holy Spirit has led him to a place where he's going to be tested. And he is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And through that time, he actually meets Satan face to face. I tell you now, the, the likelihood, remember, it's only one Satan like, he's, he can't be everywhere at once. You're probably not going to meet Satan in your week of prayer and fasting, okay? So do not worry. But you can still have temptations. And just like Jesus, you can hold on to what he has called you to do. And number 10, this blank, let's see if you can get this one, fasted during decision-making times. This is also a group of people 
the early church, the first Christians, yes, whatever answer you want to put there, the first Christians fasted during decision-making times. So it's a practice that you can see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's taught by Jesus. This is something that we as believers should be doing. Okay, so when we fast then, number one, we need to commit to a clear goal. We need to commit to a clear goal for a few reasons, but one of them is because you will want to quit. <laughs> you, it, you know, at the first, you have the excitement, you got that buzz, you know, we'll, we'll launch on the Sunday and we'll be like, yeah, ready, let's go Monday. And then I'm not going to lie, it hits quite early on, probably about three o'clock on Monday, you're like, oh, this is going to be a long week. And then you start like reflecting, going, but did God really tell us to pray and fast? But do I really need to seek it? Oh, but could I just, you know, eat now? When you commit to a clear goal, it really helps you to stay in alignment for when you're feeling a little bit low and a bit weak. So why are we praying and fasting? Well, because as a church, we're calling us as a community to pray and fast. And you'll see some M's on the stage. These are the topics and the themes that we are going to be praying into, our five purposes of church, because we want to see these explode. We want to serve God's purpose in our generation. And these are the purpose that he's called us to, mission, to seek the lost. He has called us to maturity, to grow in Christ. He has called us to membership, to belong to a community of church together. He's called us to magnify, to love God, to worship him. And he's called us to ministry to serve one another and to serve him and that's what our focus is going to be on and the vision and we want to see God transform us through this year we want to see growth we want to see that now is the time and for now to be the time we've got to seek after God so that is why we are fasting we've also got to decide what fast to take so remember whatever fast you decide to take Honor God with your best sacrifice. This is not something that's going to be easy. This is a sacrificial worship to him. There are three types. One is the full fast where you drink only liquids. And so, again, you're establishing the number of days that that is for. And so we're saying this is for a week. You've got the Daniel fast, which is where you eat no meat. You don't eat sweets um, and no bread. You just drink water, juice, and you can eat fruits and vegetables. And then you've got a partial fast. A partial fast can really be dictated to you. It can either be a time, so it could be like from sun up to sundown, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., or it could be a partial fast in the sense of the actual food that you're abstaining from. I think the partial fast is particularly really good and with a, a caution for if you have health issues that you practically would struggle to do a physical like full fast. Make sure that you, you know, use wisdom um, that if you do have health conditions that you're not doing a full fast and causing yourself bigger issues. But you can still honor God with your best intentions and with what you can do. So deciding how long, when you're committing a clear goal, you've got to decide how long it's for. Again, for this one, we've said it's a week, but maybe in another time in the year, you say, you know what, I want to fast. You can use these questions to help you think through, well, how long am I called to do this fast for? So we're going to do it from the 16th to the 22nd of January. And another question for you to ask is, who can join you in this fast? Often throughout scripture, we're seeing that it's a fast that's done in a group. It's either a whole um, community of believers, or it's, you know, like Esther, one person, then calling other people to join her because she needs the strength and she needs the encouragement. Maybe for parents in the room, can your children join you? You know the age and the limits of what your child can do and what they can sacrifice. But, you know, thinking through, like, even just the basics of sugar and sweets, you know, could be a great sacrifice for them. Maybe it's that you decide one meal in the day that you're going to pray through as a family. Maybe it's a Daniel fast that you can try. You can work that out and use your own discernment of what your children can partake in. But if we raise up our children in the ways of God, they will not stray from it. Amen. Okay, so when you fast, we need to commit to a clear goal. Secondly, we need to prepare spiritually, you know, Maybe you haven't opened your Bible up in a long time. That's okay. You know, God still wants to uh, hear from you and love on you. But maybe don't wait for the first time you open up your Bible this year to be the week of prayer and fasting because there'll already be a lot of tough things going on. There'll already be a lot of things that will try and distract you from opening up your Bible and praying. So maybe this week in the preparation for prayer and fasting, could you try and just spend some time with God? Maybe it's 10 minutes each day and just trying to build something so that when you come to the week of prayer and fasting, it's not like all or nothing and you're not kind of thinking, oh, I can't remember what to do, you know. And also, when you're building this week into our prayer and fasting, you can prepare yourself, surrender yourself to Christ, confess your sins to him, let go of any unforgiveness, be ready so your appetite is ready for what is going to come during the week of prayer and fasting. 
you know, you can make faith, um, make prayer your shield of faith, as it were. Number three is expect discomfort. I know, it's a lovely title. It's a lovely one, isn't it? Expect discomfort. You need to know what to expect. If you've never fasted before, your stomach will growl and moan at you, especially for the first three days. Particularly if you have a lot of caffeine, like me, you might even get headaches or brain fog. But I want you to still listen to your body. And if you're getting pains that you're thinking this is not a normal level of pain, please do seek medical advice, okay? Please do um, be sensible in all of this. But naturally, you're going to have some discomfort because your body is detoxifying from its usual rhythms and things that it would normally intake, like sugars and caffeine. But please use wisdom if you're feeling like you're getting um, other pains that would be abnormal. Number four is diligently seek God. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that it is he, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Sometimes, and like I said before, we can focus a little bit too much on the object of our prayers rather than who we're praying to. And the caution for us over this week of prayer and fasting is that we're focusing on God first. We're not focusing on what we're wanting as an answer to prayer. And so maybe you are waiting for different things. Really, the one you're waiting on is God. And I just want to give you a few quick ways that you can wait on God if you're not sure of what it means to wait on God. You can wait on God by praising him. You can wait on him by thanksgiving using your words to describe him and all the good things that he has done and who he is and his character. You can wait on God by singing, sung worship like we did this morning. You can put on some worship music and sing unto God or even sing your own worship to him as well. Wait on him by reading the word of God, reading the Bible, opening it and reading it and praying through scripture. You can pray through the Psalms, you can pray through the word that you're reading and meditate on it. Meditation is not emptying yourself, but filling yourself with good things and wholesome and true and noble thoughts and trustworthy things. And that's what meditating on the scripture is like. Also, silence and waiting, just being still in his presence and listening to what God might be saying. Confession, confessing our sins to him, petition and intercession, presenting requests to God, we can go on prayer walks. Maybe your movement would be good for you and you get inspired by creation that goes along. A family prayer and the church prayer meetings that we'll be doing that will give you more info very soon. But we're going to do a 7 a.m. prayer on Zoom each morning uh, for half an hour. And then we're going to do a 7 p.m. prayer meeting here at the church in person for an hour as well. So there's going to be plenty of ways that you can get involved. And lastly, make room for God. We've got to learn how to shut the door on distractions, which I know is really hard because it's so, so noisy in the world that we live in. But you need to not abstain from food and create this time and then binge Netflix, right? I'm saying it from someone who has done this before in a fast, right? I would come home and I thought, oh, I'm so hungry. You know what I'll do? I'll switch on Netflix and I can just, you know, forget about it. Try and es- It's like an escapism, isn't it, sometimes? Escape it so that when it's bedtime, I can just sleep. And then, okay, in the morning, I can eat again. That's not true fasting. That's just, you know, putting yourself through hunger pains. You need to seek after God. And it's not to say that you can't be on social media during this week and you can't watch a movie, but thinking about how you're making space to spend time with God, not just filling it with other distractions. And when you place yourself in a closer proximity to God, when your posture is close to him, do not be surprised that you will hear him louder and stronger than you ever have before. So what I'd encourage you as a practical thing is take like a notebook around with you, take a journal around with you and write down what God is saying to you. Sometimes you might just think, oh, that's a random thought, write it down. You never know how God is building a message within you. And, um, and be expectant to hear from God in a louder way than you ever have before. And finally, how should we end a fast? We eat. But eat small amounts, please, gradually. Do not go and feast and eat loads and loads. Then you will have other stomach pains because naturally, if you're eating less, your stomach gets smaller. And so it just needs to eat small amounts gradually and then you can build up to the usual amount that you would eat. 
And so hopefully that's practical and helpful and inspiring for you as we prepare this week to head towards um, our week of prayer and fasting. So I'd love just to pray for you before um, Pastor Jonathan comes up and just closes with a response. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you that you have called us as a church to set aside a week to seek after you and to hunger after you. And we pray that each of us, as we've got this invitation to pray and fast, that we will make the right preparations this week, physically, spiritually, mentally, so that we can start strong. And that we pray, God, that we'll be expectant to be so full on you that we have to empty ourselves of things that is not of you, God. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will re-energize us, that you will strengthen us, you will empower us. We pray that we'll be so active doing your will for our lives, God, that fear will have to be removed. We pray, Lord, that your will will be done in our life, we pray. We pray that we'll be feasting on your word through this time of prayer and fasting, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.